whoever you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here today with our worship. I want to start our worship welcome by uh, uh, welcoming our folks from Lakeside United Methodist Church who will be here as part of our service today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as we continue with our service, I invite you to stand as you are able and face the baptismal font. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. In the waters of baptism, we have passed from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for the river of life flowing freely from your throne through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters, you flood us with your mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gates of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, to be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving now and forevermore. Amen. We'll continue our worship with our gathering hymn.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We'll continue our worship this morning with our period.
you welcome all saints and sinners into your kingdom. Help us to be as welcoming and as accepting as you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the reading. First reading comes from Romans 1, 1 through 17. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness, by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you or rather so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith as it is written. The one who is righteous will live by faith. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus, the gospel of the Lord. We're going to come all the way up. Good morning. Good morning. Was it right here? Oh, my goodness. You do have baby and pigtails. How beautiful you look today. Thank you for being here today. Okay. So I want you to do me a favor. Can you do, tell me something? Um, I, I, I was Jesus. Okay. Okay. If you were going to be a superhero, if you were going to be a superhero, what superhero would you be? And what would be your special power? I want to be a princess. You want to be a princess, is what she says. I think that is a perfect superhero for you because you are already there. And I would like, if I, I, I don't care what you call me, I just want to be able to fly. That's all I really care about. I just want to be able to fly. I have these dreams all the time about flying, but that's a whole different story. Hey, what would you be? I have no idea. You have no idea. Well, I already know that you're a superhero. You're a super genius guy. You have the superpower of your brain. He's looking at me like I'm stupid. <laughs> okay, that's okay. <laughs> Jack, is your superpower sucking your thumb? <laughs> he says no he says no well think about this you know we watch superheroes all i went and watched guardian of the galaxy 3 on uh, friday night i'll tell you about it some other time but uh in terms of superpowers you know you actually do have a superpower did you know that you do yeah. you do you know your superpower yeah i got eyes you got what i got eyes eyes Okay. Wow, she's going on down. I just want to give her all this children's sermon. Just let her do it on her own. Well, the superpower that you have within you is the power to change lives. You are da da super Christian, right? He's still looking at me like I'm stupid. <laughs> all right. So yeah, when you, were, when you were baptized or when you were born, God put this spirit in you. And Paul, who uh, we were reading as our first reading this morning, the, 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 when he writes to the church, he says, I have the power of God, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. And you and you and you all have that same power inside. You have the gospel, the good news, and that's the power of God within you. And that, my friends, makes you a superhero. You just got to get your costume right. You want to try that? Try this. No, he says, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's a superhero thing. Well, let's pray and give thanks to God for that. Let's pray. All right. Say, dear God, thank you for giving me your power. Help me to share the gospel with others. Amen. You may go back to your seats, superheroes. Bye, Jack. Look at me like I'm stupid or crazy, but yeah, I've gotten that look a lot of a few times, often from my own ch uh, children and grandchildren. Okay. Some people say I'm weird. I don't know what that's all about either. Okay. I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't like to start worship or uh, to be up here in the pulpit without first sort of unburdening myself of my struggles for the week. And today, uh, as I've gathered with you, I want to start my sermon 
with a confession. We didn't do that in the worship this morning, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my confession right here. I know I'm not supposed to be this kind of person, and I, I know that I'm supposed to strive to be the kind of person that is really good and, and, and that kind of thing, but I, I had a weak moment this past week, and, and my confession is um, I, I dreamed about winning the lottery. I don't know if you do this, but I, but I, all this week I find myself daydreaming. Oh man, I sure wish I won the lottery. And I don't want to win a small one. Um, somebody was sharing me with me this morning in the first service that they had won one of the small ones. I want one of the big ones. And if I'm going to dream, I'm going to dream big. I want one of the big ones. And, and, and I dreamed, oh, how cool that would be uh, if I could only win the lottery. And now I know it's terrible to dream about winning the lottery because, you know, the church has historically sort of had some position against the lottery because it tends to, uh, to, uh, to focus in on the people who can at least afford to buy tickets because, you know, they hope that it'll change their lives. But all that aside, I, I, I dreamed about it this week, you know, daydreaming about it. And not only did I daydream about it, but I made up a list of the top ten things I would do if I won it. Now, I hope that you all do this as well. Well, let me make sure. Am I the only one that ever dreams of winning the lottery? Raise your hands if you're all right. Okay, that makes me feel better. I, I'm not such a bad person after all. I'm in good company with you all. Well, the things I did in order to make me feel better is, is the first thing that I would do is, Paul, this one is for you. I would take care of the church, this church, and make sure we never have another money problem at all. Paul says, no, he doesn't want the money from, the, from me. Okay, I will do some other church that never has a problem with money. <laughs> That'll make me feel good. And then I, I would certainly buy houses for my kids because, you know, we want to take care of our kids. I, I'd, I'd make, here's, here's one, this is solely about me, but it'd make me feel good. Uh, and this is for our, 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 our professors at colleges. I, I'd establish a chair in my name in the religious department of every college I ever attended <laughs> because it would make me feel good. And then, you know, here's one I hadn't thought about until this, this past week. I was reading an article, and I'll, um, I'll try to track it down if you're interested, about this church. It took $15,000, and they went out on the market and bought debt, medical debt. You know, you can buy that stuff for pennies on the dollar. And they took $15,000, and they bought almost a million dollars worth of medical debt. And then... They wrote letters to those people and said, don't worry about it. We got you covered. I would do that. I would buy medical debt. Just forgive it because it sounds like a really cool thing to do. And then after I've taken care of everybody else, of course, I'd buy myself a car, a new house, and I'd go on vacations. That's the, that's the selfish part of it all. We, yeah, yeah, we would go on vacation, <laughs> says my wife. Yes, absolutely. We would go on vacations. <laughs> Ah, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't ever really expect that I'm going to win a lottery. That's a whole other reason down the road why I won't. But um, you know, it, it is sort of nice to think about winning a lottery. I mean, let's be honest: to have that kind of power and that kind of uh, resources to be able to change the world in our lives. Even though, you know, as Christians, we're not supposed to think about power. And there's a whole, again, as I said earlier, there's a whole lot of uh, dynamic about the whole sense of where the lottery sort of takes from. But that said, it's, it's sort of nice to think about having that kind of um, resources and power until I feel bad about myself. Because, you know, as Christians, we're not supposed to think about power. We're supposed to be those kind of people who are humble servants of our Lord. We're meek and we're mild and... We always want to be the servants, never want to be the ones in charge, because that's what a good Christian is, right? Meek and mild. Uh, there's a song about that. I, I can't remember it anyway. Anyway, that whole sense of that. So the, this, think about the sense of having this kind of power that could significantly change the lives of others, even my own life, is kind of, uh, is, it, it causes a turmoil within me, a, a struggle. But then, uh, fortunately, as I was daydreaming this week, I also happened to also, shortly after, read our lesson, this first lesson from Paul's church to the, uh, to the church at Rome. And I began to think, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing to think about 
power because, in fact, as Paul writes this letter, that's sort of one of the things he talks about in our letter this morning. So let me back up for those of you who may not be really familiar with this church, uh, this letter to the church at Rome. So all the other letters that Paul has written that we have in our, gospel, in our, in our New Testament, the, the, church, the church to Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Colossians, the Galatians, the, uh, the Thessalonians, all of these other let churches, Paul is all responsible for having established those churches. So he already had a relationship with them. So you will note probably in those letters that the content of those letters are slightly different than the content in this letter. Paul doesn't have any relationship with the church at Rome, and so the very first thing that he has to do is begin with a personal introduction to who he is. And he does that by saying, oh, look, I'm, a God, I'm an, a, an apostle called. I wasn't one of the original 12, but I was called by the Spirit on this experience with, uh, on the road, and, and I've been imbibed, in, in, in and in, in, I've been given the power of the Holy Spirit, and that allows me then to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ which is where he gets to it at the, sort of the introduction. Here I am, and what I bring to this, uh, to this, or what I hope to bring to you, is this message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul writes it this way, and we all know these words, these really famous words. We may not know a lot of scripture, but this is one of those passages that we know. It goes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of salvation for everyone who has faith. The power of salvation. The power of salvation. Now you may think this is sort of an interesting and odd introduction to this letter that Paul writes to the church. Why? I mean, he could have done some other things, just said, hello, how are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. But he wants to early on establish for this church why he's writing, because he's offering them something as opposed to what they may believe that they already have. So we know that... Um, this time in, in, in the history of uh, the world, Rome is considered the only superpower there is. All the known world, as far as the Romans are concerned, has been conquered, and has been conquered by the might of the Roman army. As they go out, they conquer these various lands and enslave these people or allow them whatever uh, dynamic they have, and they leave their armies all around it's a sign of the power of Rome to have an army, a garrison, stationed in your town. A reminder of who it is that you answer to. And not only that, here it is that Paul is going to visit Rome, the very center of this power. And this center of this power houses none other than the Son of God, Caesar. Paul offers up this introduction to remind these people that this Roman life, this Roman power, isn't all that it's supposed to be. Or is it all that it says it is? Let me put it that way. Did you know um, the, the paradox of language and the irony of language? Uh, you, how many of you have heard the term uh, the Pax Romana? Right? The peace of Rome, right? That's, that's the phrase. But do you know how that peace of Rome comes about? By violence, that's right. This, having this huge army that's the superpower. They go around the world putting their army in place and establishing this peace. But there's no real peace in all of this. It's just oppression. It's a false sense of what's really of value and life in this world. So Paul writes to this church, to the very home of this power of the world, to say, I've got something that I'm coming to bring to you that's much greater than the power of Rome, much greater than the power of Caesar. It is, in fact, the very power of God for salvation and hope for all who believe and have faith. Paul has always had this sense of this greater power struggle that's going on. Early on when he wrote to some of his other churches, he would always remind them that this power that God, that comes through God through the Holy Spirit, that this power that we have in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is a power the world can't understand. The world sees things in power like armies and wealth. But Paul talks about a power that comes from God through the power of the Spirit. 
And that challenges anything the world may believe you. He writes a letter uh, sometime before this Rome, Roman letter. He writes it to the church at Ephesus. And he reminds them these, with these words, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Paul is reminding him that this power of Jesus Christ stands in opposition to this power of this world, the dark power and forces of this world. This is what Paul comes to bring and proclaim through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The powers of this world, according to Paul, cannot stand against the powers of Jesus Christ. It's the reality of the power of the gospel. That this world will be changed every place the gospel is spoken. Now, often in our lives, we, um, uh, we, we have other daydreams. I'm going to go back to my daydreaming earlier this week. So, I don't know if you guys, some of you admitted that you daydream about the lottery. How many of you daydream about the church? <laughs> Not many, right? Not many of you are sitting around going, oh, wow, I, I want to, you know. Um, but I do, I do daydream about the church. Uh, and un, not unlike my daydreams about the lottery winning it big, I, I daydream also about the power of having a big church. I know it's, I'm, your, I'm your pastor and I'm not supposed to dream about these things because it sounds too worldly, but I do daydream about the church. I, I daydream that the church would realize the power of the gospel within them. I daydream that the people would realize that they have something that the world desperately needs. I daydream that somehow, through some circumstances in our lives, we would be given an opportunity to share that gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Because I believe, and I know the church believes, that that power can, in fact, change the world that we live in. It can withstand any false power and authority of this world. And it can subdue it by the power of Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so as I daydream, I always daydream about these things. Especially when it comes to the church. But then you know what happens? Is I wake up and I realize I do not need to daydream. For in fact, we believe, I believe that I do, in fact, pastor a church that believes in the power of the gospel to change lives. I just need you to believe it. I know that in your lives, as you live out your faith, you believe that Jesus Christ has changed your life and has made a difference in how you're living out your faith, how you're living out in this world. I know now that you, as I have always known about you, that you are a believer in the power of the gospel. The dream of every pastor, the dream of this pastor, is that you would see what I see in you. That you are, in fact, powerful witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have every bit the authority to write to the church, as Paul does, and say, look, you may believe in something else, but this is what you should believe in, the power of the gospel to change lives. This is the message that you carry within you because, as Paul says, you have faith. You are not just some one little individual who can't make a difference in this world. You are, in fact, the superhero that can change the world by the power of your faith. Living out that faith. I, I do dream about winning the lottery. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I guess I should be a better person. Of course, as my sister reminds me, I'm never going to win the lottery because I first have to buy a ticket. I'm one of those guys who just dreams about winning it but never buys a ticket. But I'm so thankful that I'm surrounded by people like you that makes the dreams that I have about the church not be dreams but be facts and realities. You are God's chosen people for a mission and ministry that God has given to you. And I know that you are living out that faith. I see in you pro proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in powerful ways. If you could just see that about yourself. If you could just believe in yourself. We wouldn't have to worry about me being up here every Sunday. I could rotate this path, this pulpit with you. Oh, each of you, you'd each have your opportunity up here. Today, as you go out, as you live out your faith this next week, I'm asking you to believe in yourselves. See that you are, in fact, like Paul, an apostle through Christ Jesus. See that you are, in fact, through the living out of your life, an introduction to the power of that gospel in this world. Know that God has given you everything that you need to proclaim that good news of Jesus Christ. And then go out and dream a dream of a changed world. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith.
we believe in one God, the Father of Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begot not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven with the torrent of the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he arose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge living and dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord of who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Please kneel if you are able. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of rebirth, the good news of your resurrection brings refreshment to a weary world. Following the women at the tomb, empowering us to boldly share your radical love through our words and our work. Hear us, O Lord, O God. The worship is great. As you breathed your spirit into the disciples, breathe your spirit of healing upon all creation. Nourish the earth with sufficient rain and strengthen us to encounter the effects of pollution and destruction. Hear us, O God. The mercy is great. You prepare the disciples for their ministry by calming their fears and granting them your peace. Equip our community leaders. Give them a spirit of peace and hearts that burn for justice that their leadership reflects your love. Hear us, O God. You come among us in unexpected ways. Send us to those who hide in fear or question your love. Be a healing presence for all isolated by addiction in, in, in jail, mental, mental illness, chronic pain, sickness or grief, especially Bob, Chuck, Steve, Carol, Hope, Ann, Franny, Bruce and family, Charlie, George, Janine, Benson, Stephen, Rebecca, Kitsy, Jennifer, Stacy, Landon, Jane, Todd, Brenda, Joe, Paul, Judy, Jeff, Shirley, Betty, Zach, Donna, Marietta, Donna, John, Alex. Hear us, O God. You met the disciples on the road to our Emmaus. Show us your presence along our journeys. Bless our doubts and questions. Provide trusting and safe relationships for all ages to nurture our connection to to you and one another. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God, bring us a new life every day. Trust for trust, thank you for blessing us and companions on your faith journey, especially those who now rest in your love. Strengthen us with the eternal peace of your promises. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God. 
through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share the peace with those around you.
God of good gifts, receive these and all of our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Jesus Christ, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You called your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, you we praise and glorify, you we worship and adore. Your spirit formed the earth from chaos and encircled the globe with air. You created fire for warmth and light. You nourished the lands with water. You molded us in your image and with mercy higher than the mountains, with grace deeper than the seas, you blessed the Israelites and cherished them as your own. That also we, estranged and dying, might be adopted to live in your spirit, you called us through the life and death of Jesus. And the night which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together, as the body of Christ, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your son, and we await his coming when, with the world made perfect through your wisdom, all our sins and sorrows will be no more. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated just a moment. For those of you who are watching the stream at home, I invite you that if you have bread and wine, bread and grape juice, bread and water, any two elements of this earth, and in receiving those elements you believe in the true presence of Christ in your life, then I say be a part of this communion. For those of you who are gathered here, come and receive Jesus, our strength in the wilderness.
please stand as you're able and receive this blessing from our communion. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated for a few announcements this morning. I want to, uh, again, thank uh, Lakeside United Methodist for joining us this morning uh, and adding, what, two octaves to our... So thank you again. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, make sure Mark realizes that you all had wine while you were over here. <laughs> uh, uh, any other announcements this morning? Yes, yes. next Thursday, 6 o'clock. None of these places have food, do they? You always have to bring your own stuff. Some do. Some don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if you come and be, come be a part of that. It's a lot of fellowship and a lot of fun. You know, I've said something about that in my sermon a couple times. Um, there's also softball on Tuesday. Uh, short cup. Right, Tom? Yeah. 6, yeah. six thirty. All right, thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Other announcements this morning? Okay. I, I do want to take a brief moment. I'm going to cover up the microphone. Uh, we, we included Chuck's boss in our prayers this morning. Uh, Chuck went in the hospital this past week, uh, yesterday. So if you would like Chuck and Caroline a letter, just let them know that we're praying for them and thinking about them. I'd appreciate that. And if you don't know the address, call the office and we'll be sure that you get that. Or Dr. Laura, she knows that. She'll know that address, yes. But uh, it, it's very much appreciated the Dr. has been going through prayer. So thank you. Anything else this morning? If not, then I invite you to rise as you are able for this blessing. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending hymn. 